You know, God is so good. And I'm falling in love with him all over again. Well, it's time to receive the tithes and offering. I know you're ready because you came ready, right? Amen. Hallelujah. We came ready to tithe and give. Because we understand the purpose of tithing and giving. It's not just a ritual. But it's to make sure that the kingdom of God have access to everything that we are. And we got access to everything God is. Woo, Jesus. That's including his guidance, his wisdom, his money. Everything. Real estate, I don't care what you need. God got it. And he wants you to have it. That's the good thing about God. He wants us to have the best. One thing, I, I heard a statement, and I took it for myself. It said, God has reserved his best for me. Oh, I love that. I love that. When I heard it, I caught hold of it. I said, God reserved his best for me. I'm not going to settle for second. And, you know, before I share with what we're going to receive the tithes and offering first anyway, but... I was ministering to someone yesterday. I had someone to come past my house, and they were so hungry for the word. Oh, it just did my heart so much good. <laughs> I said, Lord, you knew exactly what I needed. And I mean, they were sitting there for probably about an hour and a half. And, we, and I just poured into her and poured into her. And she was asking questions like a baby should. Oh, I tell you, it thrilled my heart to know that she was turned on to the Lord that way. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's receive the tithes and offering. You know, I have learned to trust in tithing and giving. It is so real that if you ever grab hold of it, let me tell you something. You can give yourself out of any situation you're in. Physically, spiritually, financially, mentally, erate your relationships. You can give yourself right on out of those situations. You can be so committed to tithing and giving. You know, I hear a lot of people say, tithing is not for the day. Well, I haven't read that in the Bible yet. They say, just supposed to give. Okay. I didn't see where Jesus exchanged his high priestly office over the tithe and just be saying, you can just give. I didn't see it. Now, when you can show it to me, and you can give me more than one validation according to the word, I'll accept your word. But until then, I will be a what? A tither and a giver. Because this is what brought us out. Oh, Jesus. And it's taking me all the way through. Glory to God. Are you ready? Come on, let's do this because we already have the victory. Father God, we're so grateful for this great covenant called tithing and giving. Now, Jesus, you are the high priest over the tithe and the offering. Therefore, we brought out the whole tithe. We have not demoted the tithes in our hearts. Neither have we transgressed against the tithe. We have kept the tithe holy set aside for your use only now we've also brought the offering that you put in our hearts so cheerfully joyfully and hilariously we sow our seed because we know that you are the lord of the harvest you are the one that calls increase so with great boldness we decree and declare that money coming to us and money is loosed upon us for the cause of this great and wonderful gospel if you're in agreement let's tithe and give why we got what? Supernatural expectation. If you would like to support Rapture Ministries financially, you can do so online. Go to raptureministries.org and click the Give button. There you can give securely through PayPal. If you're one of our local members, be sure to include your CID number and your giving breakdown. We thank you for every gift. You help make all this possible. Thank you. Glory to God. Father, we're so grateful that you made us to be partakers of this end time harvest. We yield to the harvest. We won't struggle with the harvest because we know it's your desire that we prosper. And we receive that now. 
We thank you that money coming to us and money is indeed loosed upon us. And the supernatural power of God is at work right now, causing our seed to increase. So angels, we command you now to bring that harvest in because we are excellent givers and reapers. And we decree and declare that we are rich beyond our imagination. According to Ephesians 3.20, you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we believe that and the power is working in us. So we believe that we receive, that we are end time financiers of this great gospel in the mighty name of Jesus. Well, go ahead and be seated in his presence. Hallelujah. 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 I'm not going to be up here long because the Lord might have a word for my, through my son, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and share with what he shared with me. On, y'all know Wednesday, Pastor Transition, and he is not trying to come back. <laughs> so, you know, I might have my moment, but I know where he is. Hallelujah. I want you to look at Jeremiah 31, verse 3 and 4. Because when I went into prayer on Thursday morning, well, actually Friday morning, was in, I was in prayer. The Lord woke me up about 4 o'clock, and he said, read this. And I had the TV on, and I had it on a particular station. I was listening to the, the music called Reflections. And I heard this bird chirping, and I'm going like, a bird chirping? I thought it was in the music. So I muted the TV, and I kept hearing the bird chirp. And I said, sound like the bird is in my room. I said, no, nah, no, nah, no bird got in my house. But the bird chirped three times, paused, chirped three times again, paused, again the third time. And then I didn't hear it, it flew away. It was sitting on the ledge of my bedroom window. I said, well, Lord, have you sent Elijah a raven? You sent me a Tweety Bird to let me know it's all right. But he woke me up because he wanted to share with me where he's going, what he's going to do with this church. Because it's not over. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not over. Pastor would be upset if he thought we would stop this work. Oh, my God. So look at verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built. O virgin of Israel, thou shalt again be adorned with thy tablets, and shalt go, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. So what the Lord will share with me, he says, he built this all along. I know a lot of people thought, you know, sometimes people think you're doing stuff just because you went to school. or you, No, God called us to this. He says, I built it. Now I'm getting ready to rebuild. I'm getting ready to do some things that was always in the heart of Pastor Dale, but we hadn't gotten it now. See, sometimes you don't ever know what it costs the ministry to get where you are today. He says, but I'm going to rebuild you. He says, I'm going to adorn you with joy, and you're going to pick up the tambourines, and you're going to dance with merriment. The laughter shall be in this place like never before. Why? Because we're going to be out of debt. We're going to have our own house. It's not over. It is not over. He says, I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt. And all the things that have been said and done against this church have only made us stronger. Why? Because God built this church. It was founded on the, the, on the gospel. It was founded on the word. Not only that, but we were ordained and called to this. Oh, my God. He says, I'm going to rebuild you. And he says, you will pick up the tambourines. Got mine already. You need to buy your tambourine. He says, you will pick up your tambourines again, and you will dance with joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to dance with joy. Hallelujah. 
Now, that's what the Lord shared with me concerning the church right now. That as he give me more, I'll tell you more. Amen. But what I want to share with you this morning, turn to Colossians 3. Because you got to understand something about the devil. We're in the very last age of the church. And it's time to gird ourselves up with love. Man, we got to wear it like our skin. You, you know, some people say like a coat. No, you need to wear it like your skin. So you just can't pull it off when you, you know, when you get a little moment. You don't take your skin off just because you got a little moment, do you? No, you need to wear love the same way. Love that overcomes all. Colossians 3, 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Why? Because the family is under attack. And, and, and what we have to do is get out of this mode of being selfish. You can't be selfish and be in love at the same time. They just don't go together. I, I discovered that. And one of the things that my husband taught me was to become a giver. He taught me how to share not only my substance, but my life. And you got to be willing to give your life in order to get life back. Oh, man. If you, you say, well, I don't hardly have no friends, make yourself friendly. In this coming year, listen, because when God's people get in harmony, look, I don't care who's in this room, and, and some people are missing, may not be here today. We don't know where they are. We need to find out where they are. If they don't want to be known, that's one thing. But we got to start showing that love. Why? Because when God's people get in harmony with each other, miracles, say miracles, miracles. will happen. You got to go above what you would do ordinarily. Ooh. Your agreement creates an atmosphere in which God's supernatural miracle working power is free to flow. And that's something that Dr. Davis and I have been believing for, is for signs, wonders, and miracles to be in our midst. And guess what? We shall see them. It's happening now. So Satan, Satan is constantly tempting us to spoil that atmosphere. See, he's not, you know, I say all the time, the devil not trying to just steal your stuff. He's still, he's trying to get your faith. He's after your love walk. Because without love, your faith doesn't work. And you can quote every scripture in the Bible, but without love, your faith doesn't work. Faith worketh by what? Love. So we need to perfect our love walk. And I just want to encourage you, because you do have an enemy that's coming against you, and he's trying to spoil the atmosphere of love so to foul up things so that, you know, to keep us at odds with one another, over little trivia stuff. That's the one thing my husband and I overcame. That when we disagree, we, we were looking at each other and laughed, so, okay, you're right. And I love because my son adapted that. Because he's heard us say it so many times. And I, be, I said, baby, that's not right. And he looked at me, he said, okay, you're right. <laughs> Even if I was wrong, he would say, well, you know what, because it wasn't worth arguing over. And when he would say that, I knew that was my cue. Calm down, girl, this is not that big deal. And then you know what? Then we would work it out. Because we learned to diffuse arguments. And you argue over stupid stuff. But it, it, it damages the atmosphere of love where power can be flowing in your house. Man, you got to keep strife out. Close the door on it. Yes, you can keep strife out. It's your assignment. Why? Because the devil knows that strife is dangerous. 
And according to James 3.16, I'll read it for you. You don't have to turn there. For where envy and strife is, there is what? Confusion and every evil work. Now the devil has an opportunity to sow stuff in your environment that ordinarily wouldn't even be there because we don't protect our love walk. And the, and the most people we do that to is our immediate loved ones. We take them for granted. We're going to put on our good attitude, our best behavior for those out there. But the devil robs us of our power in our own house because we refuse to protect the love walk. And love is not a feeling. It's a decision. It's a decision I decide to do what God said to do, whether I like it or not. This pleases God. And I may not have no pleasure in it at that moment, but the pleasure comes because my obedience brings power into my situations. And one translation say, where there is jealousy and selfishness, there will be confusion and every kind of evil. So as we're about to enter this new year, don't open the door of your home to Satan by allowing your family the luxury of a few quarters. Not even about the money that you shouldn't have spent for Christmas. Don't argue about that stuff. You got to believe God to pay for it. And you need agreement to do it. Don't get on your husband back or your wife back because she spent just a little bit more than you told her to spend. Or you, he spent more than you thought he should have spent. It's not worth it. You are robbing yourself of power. Find that place. Look, get in there and say, baby, look. I know we, we overspent, but look, God, we, we're tithers and givers. We're going to trust the Lord for this. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. We're going to make this thing right. And you learn to love each other. Who Jesus. You say things that will build each other and not destroy one another. Because in your moment of your fit, the devil had you to say something that will penetrate your mate's heart and they will ponder it and hold it and it'll begin to germinate. That's why you can't, you, you say zip, zip, zip. When you, get, you feel that, you, everybody know when they're getting angry. Everybody know when they're going to get outside of the bounds of the word. You need to go zip. And if the other one don't stop talking, you stop talking. And you can pray in the Holy Ghost while they're standing there. And, and let the Lord do what he got to do. But when you really love somebody, you learn to overcome the trivial things of life because they really don't matter. They don't add to your life. They just distract you and take away. So we learned some time ago, Dr. Davis and I, nothing is worth losing our peace over. Nothing is worth falling out of love about. And if you got to tell me something, tell me the truth. Don't tell me this and that and make me feel like, I'm, no, tell me the truth. Let me deal with it, and I will deal with it. Because that's what love does. And that was our commitment to one another. But I tell you what, I know where he is today. And he ain't trying to come back. As much as he loved me, he don't want to come back. He does not want to come back. Even when I wanted him to stay, he says, got to go. Got to go. So, come on, son. That's how you end that one because, you know, pre preachers don't know how to just say, stop. You keep right on. I got my, thank you, mama. All right. <laughs> That's a word. That's my baby right there. <laughs> now I got to preach. And you done told the whole world, that's my baby right there. There that's you go. That's right. That's mm -hmm. my baby. That's and your right. baby, too. <laughs> and I'll be your baby forever. That's right. Mm -hmm. But only yours. That's right. <laughs> oh. And you know, Mama, I'm going to be honest with you. You could have kept going. I was all right. <laughs> you know, I was just fine sitting right over there. But I know, won't it? Mm, mm, mm. Now, how do I follow that up? She doesn't. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs>
No, I, no I, the Lord give me a word. I'm just going to, I'm going to flow. Because she didn't open the door up. And um, Holy Spirit, I'm going to flow with you this morning. You've given me a word. And I'm going to share what you told me. But the door is open now. From the praise and the worship to mom, the door has been opened. So I'm just going to walk through the door and we're just going to keep on walking together, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the spirit of joy in this place. I thank you for the spirit of thanksgiving in this place. I thank you for your anointing being in this place, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that as the word comes forth, it enters into the hearts of every willing heart, every willing listener, Lord, every attentive listener, Lord, and that it makes change as they receive. I thank you for power and demonstration in this place, Lord. Move as you will. Shut me up if you desire and move, Lord. I stand out of your way, Lord, only to be used as a vessel. And I thank you for your goodness this morning, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get set up real quick. My daddy bought me this watch for Christmas, believe it or not. And it's got a timer on it. But it's special because y'all can't hear the timer. So you don't know how much time I got. <laughs> you, know, you know, when the phone go off, everybody stop listening. They start closing their Bibles up. And they go up. <laughs> you out of time, so he wrapping it up. This one just vibrates. So you'll have no idea. <laughs> you got to trust me. <laughs> I'm going to do a little bit of reading, and then we're going we're gonna to get into this. Um, let's start with, I'm going to go two places and then we're going to open this up. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm just going to jump right in because I don't need no introduction. Mama took, that wasn't an introduction for me. I want y'all to know that. That was just word. That's why I was, I was just enjoying myself sitting right over there listening. But mama, she told, when she tossed the ball to you, you got to catch it. So I'm just going to go right in. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and I'm going to go at verse 1. And then I'm going to go somewhere else, and then we're going to talk about it. This is the Lord speaking to the children of Israel. He's bringing them into the land, the promised land. They've come out of Egypt. They've gone through 40 years in the desert, unnecessary 40 years in the desert. And now they're coming into the promised land. The Lord has some commandments for them. Now move over to the new covenant. And Paul, in the book of Hebrews, is speaking to the, the Hebrew church. And he is making a similar observation. He says, now the gospel is yours. The gospel being the promised land of the spirit. Where the children of Israel in the Old Testament had to go to a specific place and that land was promised to them. And in that place was good land and wealth. Now... The promised land is in us everywhere we go, because we've been given the original assignment that Adam lost and Jesus gained again. Jesus got back for us. Now we've been given the original assignment to subdue the earth. So now everywhere we go, we make it to a promised land. See, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, it was wilderness. They could depend on God for provision, but not prosperity. They didn't prosper in the wilderness. They just survived. Right. To prosper, God had to move them out of the wilderness into the promised land. But in us is the gospel. So everywhere we go, if we're in a wilderness, we don't have to leave the wilderness. We turn the wilderness into a promised land. Because the creative power that's, that created this world, that was given to us to subdue this world, is now in us. So now God manifests himself through us in wherever we are. But the mindset of the old wilderness thinkers, the mindset of the old children of Israel, has to be challenged and removed and destroyed by us. Here was Paul's concern. Paul's concern was that when we heard the gospel, now what is the gospel? It's, it's called the good news, but I want to go a little deeper than that. The gospel is simply this. We talked about this last week or two weeks ago. I don't remember now. A lot's happened over the last couple of weeks when we were talking about John the Baptist. And Jesus's ministry. And we were talking about repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the gospel. The gospel is this. Change your thinking because the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven's way of doing things is now present in this earth. 
the kingdom of heaven is now going to remove and replace the kingdom of darkness that has been at work in this area. So if you work on if you work for a company, when you go to work, the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be at work in whatever area you have dominion over. Even if it's just your desk, your clients, whatever your job is, the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be at work there. Your thinking is supposed to change. So when they see difficulty, you see opportunity. When they see loss, you see success. When they see death, you see life. When they see pain, you see prosperity. This is the kingdom of heaven. It's a change in the thoughts that then changes who we are that manifests in the way the world responds to us. Not the way we respond to the world, because we're not supposed to respond to the world. We're supposed to make the world respond to us. We enter into a situation, when Jesus would go somewhere, if there was demonic activity, they got scared. Jesus didn't even show up to cast demons out half the time. He would just show up and demons would recognize him and get scared and reveal themselves. And they started asking Jesus questions. What are you doing here? Are you here to cast us out before our time? Because everywhere Jesus went, he revealed the kingdom. Okay, so Paul is expressing to the children of Israel in the book of Hebrews. He's saying, look, now the gospel has been preached to you. Be mindful that your heart is not hardened and that you don't enter into his rest. Then he makes an interesting observation. He said in Genesis, and I'm paraphrasing, after the Lord had completed all his work, he rested. This is interesting because God always operates. Let me put it this way. God has done no new work since Genesis chapter three. Or Genesis chapter two, I mean. He did everything in Genesis. Then he rested. The fight for mankind has been to enter into that. The fight for mankind has been to enter into that, to fully embrace that God has already done it, that God has rested. In Hebrews 3 and 4, Paul is challenging the church to enter into what God has already done, not try to get him to do something else like you would a dead God. Because it's your faith in a living God who has constant, who has already prepared everything that you're ever going to encounter. He is already prepared. And then he placed it in the gospel. Then he put that gospel in you. And I'm doing a lot of paraphrasing because I don't have time to, to break every one of these boxes open today. But the gospel in you turns your attention to the living God. It's not a set of rules and regulations. It's, a, it's an awareness that this situation that has challenged me has already been answered. And it's my responsibility to enter into the rest or the completeness of that answer. It's my responsibility to pursue the rest, the completeness. It's not my responsibility to find out how to make that problem go away. And this is where we, you can get off by a couple of degrees and still be close to the truth. But the farther you go, the farther off you become. Just because you're a few degrees off. Your responsibility, and, and we're not talking about unto the world, we're talking about unto ourselves, unto the church, and our fellowship with God, is to stay in a position where we are aware of the rest. We are aware that everything Christ came to do was to simply bring us back into a place of rest, to turn us back to Genesis chapter 2, where after God had done everything and had laid everything in place, he rested. Somebody find for me the Jesus... Um, rebuking the storm. I, I'm, the Lord's reminding me of something. I know it's, it's in the Gospels, obviously, but where he rebukes the storm. I know it's in more than one place, but I want to find... Well, I don't, I don't care which one it is. Someone find that for me, please. Because... 
The Lord. Thank you, Mommy. She's my baby, too. He said, Mark 4. Yep, 37. We'll start at verse 35. Mark chapter 4. And on, in the same day when the evening was come, Jesus said unto them, let us pass over to the other side. So he had been preaching. He had been teaching. He had been performing miracles. He was tired. He wants to get on the boat and cross the other side. So real quick, Jesus, his headquarters was in Capernaum. He did a lot of preaching all in the area of Galilee, Jerusalem, and the Sea of Galilee, which is a very large body of water, was a common thoroughfare to get from one side of the country to the other. Instead of going around the land route, which could take days, you get on a boat and just cross. Kind of how we have the uh, tunnel. That if, you're going in, if you're going to Hampton, from this side of the water, you get in the tunnel, you just cross the water instead of going all the way around, right? So the Sea of Galilee was like that. And if you were alive back then, you would see boats coming and going all day. It was not just the middle of the ocean and just one boat. It was a populated thoroughfare. It still is today. There were many boats, different sizes, fishermen fished out there, but it was a populated, it was a transport route that shortened your travel time. So Jesus would get on the boat and say, let's go to the other side, so he could go back to his headquarters and they could rest. He could go home. And so, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took him as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. It was common to see a lot of little ships around. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea will be? Okay, so we know this story. Watch this. When they woke Jesus up, they didn't know he could rebuke the storm. They asked him, they asked after the fact, rather, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So my question was, well, what did they wake him up for? <laughs> what did they want him to do He's asleep. If we're all going to die, let me sleep. If we're all on a boat and you don't think I can do anything more than you can do and I'm asleep, let me die in my sleep. Don't wake me up so I can be afraid with you. What you going to run to me for? They didn't know Jesus was going to do this. They didn't even know he could do this. So it wasn't like they were waking him up because they said, hey, do something about this storm. That's not what they asked him. They didn't ask him to do anything. Because they didn't think he could. They just wanted to know if he cared enough that they were dying. How many times have we been in a storm and gone to God and asked him if he cared? And we might not have said it so boldly, but we say it in how we pray. We say it in how we come to him. Like he doesn't know there's a storm. What I have learned is that if you're in a storm and God is asleep, you're going to be okay. Whenever something that could potentially destroy me was going to come upon me, God would always wake me up. He would always give me opportunity. He would always prepare me. Now I'm going to share some revelation with you. I'm going to share some insight into how God moves. When you are in constant fellowship with the Lord, he will prepare you sometimes days, weeks, months in advance. And you don't always know what he's preparing you for. But he'll begin to move you. He'll get you up at three o'clock in the morning and say, just come here and just read this and just pray this. And you don't know what it's for because he's preparing you for something that would destroy you if you weren't prepared. And that's good. because That's his love. He's a good father. That's what he does. But then there are those times when something happens and it looks like God's not interested at all. It looks like, why didn't you prepare me for this? Why didn't you, you could have said something to me. Two weeks ago when I was praying, you knew this bill was coming and you didn't say anything. 
When God is asleep, you're going to be all right. The best thing you can do is go to sleep with him. Don't wake God up because of a storm. And of course, I'm speaking figuratively. We know he doesn't sleep. When I say asleep, I mean when God is in his position of rest. That means this answer is already done. You see, Jesus was in his position of rest. It wasn't the storm that was going to kill them. It was their unbelief. It wasn't the storm. If the storm was really going to kill them, Jesus wouldn't have put them in it. Because he was in the boat too. Jesus didn't want to swim. <laughs> he wanted that boat to get to the other side just like they did. If the storm was going to be a problem that they couldn't handle, Jesus would have prepared them. Jesus went to rest because he was in a position of rest. The storm didn't bother Jesus. And there's no scripture that suggests he was going to do what he did if they hadn't woke him up. And a lot of times we focus on the event, the miraculous side of the event. And we don't focus on what led up to the event. A lot of times we, we write songs about Jesus stopping the storm and rebuking the wind and the waves, and that's great. But why was Jesus upset? If this was an opportunity for him to just show off his power, you'd think he would have reveled in the moment, but he didn't. Jesus was upset with his disciples. What was he upset with them about? That they didn't have enough faith to do it themselves. He'd been performing miracles all day in front of these guys. In Hebrews 3 and 4, in Hebrews chapter 3, Paul writes that the children of Israel saw miracles in the wilderness for 40 years. They were not absent of miraculous manifestations of God. Miracles and manifestations are wonderful. They are, they, God is the bringer of those things, but they don't change the mind. You have to decide to believe. Jesus had been performing miracles all day. They've seen his word, his power at work, and yet they get on a boat, they're in a storm, and because they're afraid of death, they wake him up to share in their fear. <laughs> why? So then why did Jesus rebuke the wind and the waves? That now we're going to see the love of God at work. The love of God is this. Jesus understands, just like he does with us, that sometimes you can't teach when there's a storm. The storm wasn't the problem, their unbelief was. But he couldn't deal with their unbelief as long as the storm was going on. So he turned his attention to the storm long enough to deal with it, to eradicate it. He takes the storm out of the equation and then he turns back to them and he preaches to them about their lack of faith. He doesn't even bring the storm up anymore. He brings up the fact that they didn't have enough faith to deal with the storm themselves. Because the storm was never the problem. A lot of the things that are problems to us that we call storms aren't the actual problem. It's the, it's the inability in, our, in ourselves, or our unwillingness rather, because we have the ability. It's our unwillingness to enter into a position of rest. It's our unwillingness to enter into a position of rest. You have to know where Jesus is at any given situation. You can always, this is why fellowship is so important, not fellowship for the purpose of getting something, but fellowship for the purpose of knowing him. Because the better you know him, it's like a, it's like a GPS. You can find him. And you always want to be where he is. You always want to be in whatever state of mind he's in. So this bill shows up or this doctor's report shows up. The first thing you want to know is not what God can do. We know what he can do. It's not what God will do. We know what he has. We know what his will is. It's, it's, he wrote that stuff down. It's where is he in relation to this issue? Is he asleep? All right, I'm going to sleep too then. You know, a couple weeks ago, I had a financial challenge in my business. You know, when you run it, when you operate a business 24-7, businesses, they eat money, man. They eat as much money as they make, <laughs> you know, and that's business, right? You as your business grows and expands, in cost increase and that kind of thing. And I got up, I, I was, I slept pretty good, but about five in the morning, I just woke right up with that on my mind, right? And I was like, okay, I can do this, I can do that. I need to start doing that, because then I can generate income, this, this, and that. And I said, mm, 
I don't usually get up till about seven on, I forgot what day it was, whatever day it was. I don't usually get up till about seven. So I was like, well, I'm up two hours early and I want to go back to sleep. So I started confessing scripture, right? I started thinking, of you know, prosperity and that kind of stuff. And that wasn't working. So then I, uh, I turned and looked at my wife. She was knocked out. So she was no help. <laughs> I said, I know I'm going to look on my phone and just kind of, I'm browsing around on my phone. I said, well, ain't nothing good happening in the news. So let me turn that off. So now I'm just tossing and turning. It's about 30 minutes goes by. I'm tossing and turning. And I'm trying all my spiritual stuff, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to quote scripture to myself because my Bible's across the room and I don't feel like getting out of bed. Because you know when you're comfortable and you, you done made that spot warm, you don't want to get out of that spot. You want, you want the Bible to come across the room to you. You don't want to get up off that spot, right? That spot was warm. I've been working with it all night, see? So I'm like, Lord, I'm going to have to do something. So I said, so after about 45 minutes of tossing and turning, I said, well, I only got about an hour of sleep left before I have to get up. I said, if, I, if I'm ever going to do anything, I better do it now. So I got up and I went to another room and grabbed my Bible and stuff, went to another room. And I said, all right, Lord. Now, I know what you promised in your word. I said, I know. I said, I know. I don't even really have to go over it all for my benefit. You know I know. I know you know. So let's get past that. Where, why can't I sleep? I said, where, what's wrong? And I just began to worship. When you don't know what to say, you don't know what to pray, you've, you've quoted all your scriptures and confessions, start worshiping. Amen. I spent about five, I don't know, ten minutes maybe, just worshiping, just thanking God for all his goodness. Not even about money, not just prosperity. I threw that in there, but I was thanking him just for how good he was, how much he loved me. You know, all the stuff that's great about God. I told him how big he was, how big he was and how he held the universe in his hands. All this stuff just to put my attention on him. And after about 10 minutes of that, I said, you know what? It ain't but a few dollars. And then I said, OK, it ain't but a few dollars. And God's so much bigger than that. And then I got a revelation. And here's what the Lord shared with me. Here's what he showed me. He said, after about 10 minutes of praise and worship, you stopped crying about the storm and you went to sleep. He said, your problem wasn't that you didn't understand the word. Your problem wasn't that you weren't using the right scriptures or confessions. He said, all of those things only work when you're not minding the storm. He said, the problem is, he said, the problem was this morning, son, is that when you woke up, you woke up with an awareness of the storm when I was asleep. And then you woke me up so that I could answer the storm. He said, but what you, and after 45 minutes of doing that, the storm was still there. He said, but then the praise and worship put you to sleep. Now he's speaking figuratively, figuratively to me, of course. The praise and worship put me to sleep in my spirit. It put my spirit to sleep. It put my spirit at rest because after 10 minutes of praise and worship, after 10 minutes of focusing on how big my God is and how good my God is, I began to rest in my spirit. And that's when he began to reveal this to me, that the, the challenge, the internal battle of the spirit is to enter into the rest of God at all times. This lesson is for those of us that are spiritually awake, those of us that are spiritually alive, those that are born again and have the gospel in us. You see, the world can't do this. The sinner can't enter into this rest. They have to first get born again. But for those of us who are redeemed and are righteous, for those of us who have the gospel alive in us, your battle is not against the storm. Your battle is not against the storm. Your battle is against your perception of the storm. Your battle is against your awareness of the storm. It's against the position that you take in the storm. Jesus was asleep. Now, I like to believe that whatever Jesus is doing in the Bible is what I should be doing. You know, when you see Jesus doing something in the Bible and then you see somebody else doing something, I'd rather be doing whatever Jesus was doing at that moment. Jesus had no interest in the storm. So we shouldn't either. It wasn't that storms don't come, that the storm didn't come. Jesus was displaying the position of the kingdom at that moment, because that's what Jesus came to do. We talked about that. He was a display of the kingdom of God in every situation. 
So wherever Jesus went, you saw the kingdom of God's position on that problem. If there was sickness in his midst, the kingdom of God's position would address it. If there was death, he'd go to a funeral and address that dead body with the kingdom of God. If there was a storm, Jesus would address it with the kingdom of God. And in all the Gospels, this is the only time Jesus actually calmed the storm. He really didn't care about that stuff. When Jesus walked on the water in another, in another place in the Bible, it was another storm. The winds were high, the, winds, the waves were high, and they saw a man walking on the water. It was not a calm, peaceful, serene day. It was dark, it was windy, and it was stormy, and Jesus is walking on the water. Why didn't he calm the storm? Because he don't care about storms. It's not a deep revelation, people. Don't, don't read too much into it. The problem is we glorify our problems. We own them, and then we magnify them above God. So then when Jesus is asleep, we get angry. And we wake him up, we kick him. Don't you care that, we're, that I'm going to lose my house? Don't you care? They asked him. Don't you care? Now, Jesus has been taking care of these guys for years. They had the nerve to ask a man who they just seen heal and feed thousands of people, don't you care that we're going to die in this storm? And Jesus didn't even say anything to him. He just got up. Hold on, storm. We'll be back. And then rebuked his disciples. And all of us gospel heads have written a song and a half about him rebuking the storm. That's literally the least important part of that whole story. The storm was so unimportant, Jesus would not have even woke up if they didn't wake him up. I'm trying to get y'all to understand. See, the thing is, when you read the Bible, you can't read it through your culture. You can't read it through your religion. You can't read it through how you perceived it growing up, what your mama taught you or your grandmama taught you. You got to read it as it is. Jesus was not interested in the storm. If he was, if the storm was a problem, Jesus would have taken care of it. Jesus didn't rebuke the storm because they were going to die. He rebuked the storm so he could preach. Because as long as they were so aware of the storm and so terrified by it, they couldn't hear. And if Jesus was going to get one thing out of this trip, since he wasn't going to get a nap, he was going to preach. He was going to get some more mature disciples. <laughs> you understand? That's the thing about Jesus. That's the thing about God. His only goal is to mature and develop us. The stuff that you bring him as a problem is not really a problem. It's your perception of it that makes it a problem. But when your perception is on the kingdom, the problem goes away. And that's the key. Paul was in a ship that shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean. And everybody survived. Then when he got on the land, he got bit by a poisonous snake and survived. It's all about perception. Life and death situations were occurring to them all the time. People was always trying to kill Jesus. They was always trying to arrest him for something. He was always in the storm. It's not, they never crossed the, the sea when it was quiet. Wonder why that was. And what's interesting to me is, you know, the Gospels were written in the voice of the disciples. It was written by the disciples. It wasn't written by Jesus. I mean, it was inspired by God, but it was, it's, this is, these are the disciples' accounts of what happened. So they only make themselves look good in this. And they wrote it. Like, they didn't even try to make themselves look good. They wanted to get the point across. Because by the time they wrote these, they were much more mature. And they said, look, we might as well just expose all our business and expose all our problems because we ain't fitting to come up in here and be like the boat. You know, I like how they wrote the boat began to sink. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I like to think that Jesus wasn't going to sink with the boat. So maybe Jesus' piece of the boat was just going to float and the rest of it was going to sink. I really don't know. There isn't a lot of detail in, in Mark about that. But here's what I do know. Jesus was asleep and he showed no signs of waking up. So my question is this. Are you waking God up because you refuse to enter into rest? Let's go back to Hebrews and Deuteronomy for a moment. Everything that God says is something he's already done. He doesn't say things that are going to happen. He says things that he's done and he reveals them to you so that you can get a piece of it. He reveals to you what he's done so that you can partake in it. 
the, the, the group of Israelites that came out of Egypt, every single one of them was supposed to go into the promised land. And he gave them 40 years to enter into the rest. But because they were used to a dead God and not a living God, they, they needed constant manifestation. And they never pursued fellowship. So when God would say something to them that would require them to have to depend on him, they would pull back. And he said, after 40 years, I couldn't do that no more. So he killed all the guys that were in unbelief, and what was left went into the promised land. But then once they got in, he said, all right, look, because you're in a land where everything that you used to pray about is no longer an issue, what are you going to pray about now? If you woke up tomorrow in perfect health, with hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank and your family all around you loving and hugging on you, what would you pray about? Do you even really know God? Because you've only really ever dealt with him in consideration of an issue or a concern that you had. If every one of your issues, everything you could think of that was wrong was corrected overnight, what, well, what else you talk to God about? Oh, there, there'd be some praise and worship for a while, but that would get old. That would get old. Then what? Because once you got done thanking him for all the stuff he'd done, what would you do with the rest of your life? That's the question. That's what the Lord was challenging the children of Israel with in Deuteronomy 8. He says, when you built your goodly houses and you watch your kids grow up and your flocks are overflowing and everything is good, don't forget me. He didn't say, don't forget what I've done. He said, don't forget me. Amen. He said, remember the Lord your God. Yes. He said, I'm the one that got you here. Don't forget me. Amen. God didn't want to be left out of their life once he had corrected all their problems. See, the 40 years they spent in the wilderness, he was just revealing himself to them and they kept kicking against it. He was just revealing himself to them. And they kept resisting because they weren't. They weren't. <laughs> I'm going to find a way to I see I got to learn how to just deal with the vibrations, right? <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> I got multiple alarms around me. I don't know if y'all know. They weren't really interested in God. They were only interested in eating. That's why they threatened to go back to Egypt. They said, well, look, we had food and water in Egypt. They didn't care about, it, it wasn't about God for them. It was about being somewhere comfortable and safe. When they were in Egypt, they were safe, but they weren't comfortable. Then Moses came in, brought them out, made them safe, and uncomfortable. Then God came in and made them comfortable and safe, and it still wasn't enough. Because then they had to get to know God, and they didn't want to get to know God. They just wanted their stuff. Don't get used to your manna. Manna is not God's best. They got used to manna. You can't, they ate manna for 40 years. They, they, they learned to maintain enough of a relationship with God to get their bellies full and to sleep at night, and that was it. They never touched abundance in the wilderness because they never touched God, because they walked in unbelief. Unbelief is not just, I don't believe you. Unbelief is an action. It is a lifestyle that acts opposite of the truth of the kingdom. It's a, it's a perception of the world that takes the kingdom of God out of the equation and replaces it only with what they can see. That's why Jesus rebuked his disciples in the, in the storm, because their unbelief caused them to respond to God as if he didn't love them, because they put the storm first. The children of Israel put their needs first instead of their God. And that was what God called unbelief. It wasn't that he didn't have, it wasn't that he didn't want to meet their needs. 
Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God will meet everyone. He's already met every one of your needs. But the pursuit is him. The pursuit is him. The pursuit, the children of Israel were to pursue God. Jesus' disciples in the storm were to pursue being like God. It's levels. Once the gospel is preached, we're supposed to pursue being like God. And what they did was they acted like the children of Israel. We have a problem. You don't care. We're going to die. That was the problem they had with Jesus. And it was the same problem cropping up in this church in Hebrews. And that's why Paul wrote this letter this way. He said, listen, the gospel has been preached. You have now the ability to enter into the completeness and the rest of God. Your fight from here on out, and this is the message for us today, our fight from here on out is to live, not just act like, but live with a constant reality of the kingdom of God, not a constant awareness of the storm. The storm is still going to be there, but that's not why we get together on Sunday. That's not why we pray. I don't pray to solve problems. I pray to enter into the rest. I always want to know where Jesus is on any given issue. And that's where I put myself. If Jesus is asleep, I'm going to sleep. If he wakes me up, I'm, I'm up. I'm, I'm constantly pursuing God's position because that's where the kingdom of God is to be revealed. In closing, my personal pursuit for 2021, since we're talking about New Year, is that I develop in this way and that we all develop together. I have a long list of things that I desire to do for the Lord. But the number one thing at the top of that list is to know his will for me in 2021. Because I know, all, I know everything I want to do, and they're all good. They're all legal. But outside of where the kingdom is, even a good thing is a bad thing. And I don't want to be outside of where God is at any given time. Now, we did a better job in 2020 than we've ever done as a church of being where God was, especially when it came to things like politics. That was big for us. For a long time, the church had been silent, not just us, but the church in general. And we made some mistakes. We bumped some heads. We, made, we might have made a few enemies we didn't have to make. That's fine. We can clean that up. But in 2020, there was a shift in this ministry focusing on the peace of the presence of God and a renewed desire to pursue God for ourselves, not just manifestation. And then there was another focus on being where God is in our world, in our community, not just in the four walls of a church, but in politics and in business and in media and in industry and in every other part. We're waking up to our assignment as the church. And my personal pursuit for 2021 is to dig deeper into that, to go even further into that, to really just push the envelope on that, as they say. Because if we're in the will of God, we will stand. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand to your feet. Mom, did you have anything else you'd like to say? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for revelation. I thank you, Lord, that everyone heard what they needed to hear, that they can go and, and meditate on this word, Lord, and that it would develop and grow in them, Lord, unto fruit, and that that fruit would be known by all of us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your divine direction throughout this week, Lord, that every day we get up and make ourselves more aware of you and more aware of the kingdom, Lord, and that we constantly, constantly, constantly keep our awareness and our focus on you, not situations or circumstances, not problems or conditions, but only on you, Lord. We honor you with our praise and our worship and our thanksgiving. We honor my father, our pastor. We honor him with our renewed commitment to the ministry and to this family. We rebuke the spirit of division. 
and we invite the spirit of love to strengthen us with each other and among ourselves even greater than ever before. We thank you for a bright future. We thank you for power. We thank you for prosperity. We thank you for divine miracles. We thank you for signs and wonders that work in this place. We thank you for deeper, purer, newer revelation, Lord, to come alive in our hearts, Lord, to bring us closer into the kingdom of God. We thank you for your divine protection. According to Psalms 91, you've given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, and they bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against a stone. And I thank you, Lord, for your divine protection from all hurt, harm, or danger until we come again on Wednesday and we receive right now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this broadcast. Now, we don't want you to miss when we go live again. So sign up for Rapture Go. Text the Rapture to 797979. Again, it's the word Rapture to 797979. We'll send you a text message the very next time we go live. Now, if you don't live in the United States, instead go to our website, raptureministries.org, and sign up for our mailing list, and we'll let you know the next time we go live with a new broadcast. Thank you for watching.